Ε, έχουμε τον κύριο Αγαθαγγέλου μαζί. Ναι, ναι, ναι. Γεια σου, φίλε Βασίλη. Μου. Γεια σου, Βασίλη. Γεια σου, Πέτρο. Γεια σου, καλησπέρα και στους συναδέλφους. Σε ευχαριστώ για την τιμητική πρόσκληση και την τιμή που μου κάνετε για να συμπροεδρεύω μαζί σου. Είναι πάντοτε προνόμιο για μένα. Σε ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Μακάρι να μπορούσα να μου και διαζώσει εκεί πέρα. Αλλά και το live streaming είναι μία από τις τεχνολογίες τις οποίες αξιοποιούμε. Σε ευχαριστώ. Και εύχομαι κάθε επιτυχία στο συνέδριο, το οποίο πλέον είναι και καταξιωμένο επιστημονικά, αλλά και το θεματολόγιο του όλο ένα και μεγαλώνει. Έχει μεγαλώσει αυτό το συνέδριο και μας προσφέρει πολλά, ιδιαίτερα πάνω σε αυτό το clinical oriented approach. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ και ο λόγο σε σένα, Βασίλη μου. Έγινε, Πέτρο μου, ευχαριστώ. Ε, παρά την τεχνολογία όμως, πρέπει να διατηρούμε την ανθρώπινή μας ε, υπόσταση και πρέπει να είσαι εδώ πέρα την επόμενη φορά. Δεσμεύομαι. So I'm going to speak in English. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, it's an honor for me to invite to the podium Professor uh, Niraj Varma. Uh, Professor Niraj Varma, uh, we know each other since 1990. We were not bold at that time, and uh, we share uh, a friendship which is more than 34 years. Uh, he is a full-time professor of cardiology and electrophysiology at uh, the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, we started our training in electrophysiology at uh, St. Bartholomew's Hospital uh, in those days, uh, living in the dungeon, Uh, with uh, the tons of uh, paper and uh, trying to figure out uh, what uh, is behind uh, those funny signals, the sexy signals, Niraj, if you remember. So, uh, Niraj uh, uh, left the US just for us and uh, we appreciate that. And uh, he's, he's going to spend uh, the next few days with us. And uh, I want to stress that uh, this is very, very difficult for the American doctors now. I was telling them, everybody is talking about the adjacent, how nice it is to live in a, uh, you know, a civilized environment. But uh, I'm telling, I told them that uh, it's very difficult for you to get a leave for a meeting. So. There are the good things and the bad things. So over the next uh, 20-25 uh, days, eh, sorry, hours, uh, minutes, <laughs> I want to, you to be here. I want you to be here. So uh, Niraj is going to give uh, the talk about uh, dropping the floor on the QRS duration boundaries for CRT patient selection. Sex, race, height, and heart size. Does it matter? Yes. Thank you for the very warm welcome. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to this meeting. It's really a highlight for me. So I'm very pri privileged to be able to come. And I would like to speak for 25 days, but then the audience might get a little fatigued. Um, and as Vesalis was saying, our friendship goes back uh, several decades uh, and it continues to grow and our collaborat collaborative efforts also continue to grow. So a toast to that, it's been wonderful. So thank you for inviting me to give this talk. And I thought it's late in the day and perhaps you could help me with this ECG. And uh, just take a quick look at it. I don't want any details in it. This is the accompanying respiratory rate. And we're all arrhythmia experts in here. So initially, I'd just like to know, show of hands, is this normal or abnormal? We'll come back to that. <laughs> one of my, one, it's an earlier case. I apologize for the quality of the tracing. So is this normal or abnormal? A show of hands, please. Who, who thinks it's normal? No one. 
Who thinks it's abnormal? Okay, thank you. What's the accompanying functional status of this case? No limitations or limited? Unable to lie flat in bed, unable to walk up hills, wet periphery. Who suggests no limitations? No one. Limited functional status? Sounds very reasonable. Who would advocate no treatment versus treatment, perhaps implanted device? Show of hands for no treatment. Show of hands for treatment with an implantable. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is to challenge some dogmas that we hold in electrophysiology. So actually, this is the case. This is a normal ECG from an orca. It's a normal ECG. And I'm being very truthful, unable to lie flat in bed, unable to walk up hills, wet periphery, yeah? No limitations. I'm being very honest with you. And you can train for competitive sports. It's an old ECG from 1967, and this group actually measured the ECG. So interesting. So why am, I, why am I suggesting this? So what is normal? What do we consider normal for humans even? So heart rate. So heart rate is a function of body mass um, to the negative minus one fourth power, so straight line. So the larger the body mass, the lower the heart rate. Now humans are bipedal, so we stand up, so gravity works against us. So rather than body mass, height might be important. Height might be important. And interestingly, and this uh, point was made at lunchtime today, women have higher heart rates than men. But when we program pacemakers, we program them to 60. So why 60? So I was told this is normal, but the normal was adjudicated on the basis of Dutch men. So the tallest human beings on the planet and all men. So 60 was arranged as the default heart rate on a pacemaker. Maybe we should challenge that. Atrial activation, that ECG had no P waves. There's no atrial function. Do we need atrial function? So this is a case of mine. He's a marathon runner. And I mapped the right atrium. And as you can see, no voltage, zero voltage. He had a genetic deletion of all electrical activity of the atria. And you can see in the mitral um, valve Doppler, there's no A wave, but he could run a marathon. So do we actually need the P wave? Regularity, that ECG was irregular. Irregularity seems to matter, at least when you stand up. So cerebral hemodynamics are upset when you have long RR intervals in atrial fibrillation. So many of the conventional norms of an ECG that we take for granted are sort of following dogma, and I think we have to be more personalized. So I'm really going to address QRS duration. Again, a normal QRS, or I should say an abnormal QRS, is suggested as more than 120 milliseconds. And that's on the basis of some dog experiments done in the 1970s where they severed the bundle branches and they came up with the number 120. But if you look at population studies, the normal ECG in a normal person shows a QRS duration of 86 milliseconds plus or minus 10. So it should be less than 100, two standard deviations from norm. So this 120 is purely artificial. Why does it matter? Well, we look for left bundle branch block in heart failure patients. And the reason is, that CRT is a life-saving therapy in heart failure patients. CRT is a life-saving therapy. That very seldom happens in the world of medicine, in the world of cardiology. So this is a very important therapy. Um, LV pacing of left ventricular myocardium. It's slow, we know this from almost 100 years ago, actually work done in Cleveland by Wiggers. But LV epicardial pacing is slow, it's not normal, and yet it improves survival in heart failure patients. And we know from ECGI that uh, this is accompanied by normal right bundle function, slow transeptal conduction, and fast LV activation. This is what left bundle branch block is. 
And this one shows a QRS duration of 180 milliseconds. So this is good substrate for CRT. So I'm going to ask uh, your opinions on this one. And I promise you these are human ECGs this time. So first case, 69-year-old ischemic cardiomyopathy, functional class 3, QRS duration 186 milliseconds, EF 17%. Who would opt for a CRT in this patient? OK, majority. Who would not? OK, so it's a good CRT candidate. This one, case two, 56 years old, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, functional class three, QRS 122 milliseconds. 122, EF 30%. Who would opt for CRT? Nobody, one person. But let me challenge you on that. We're in Europe and you're flouting European guidelines. This is a class three indication. So how do you, how do you support your decision? Okay, it's not dilated in fact, yeah. I'll come back to that, it's, it's non-dilated, okay. idiopathic, yeah, but I'll come back to that, but thank you for that. Would anybody else implant CRT, QRS 122 milliseconds? I think when I need to see whether we can shorten the QRS. Okay, and what are the data for shortening the QRS and improving um, response? Okay, so we're talking about treatment there. I'm just talking about substrate here. But do you think this is suitable substrate for CRT or left bundle pacing? Would you take this patient for resynchronization therapy? Yes, I'm sure that I can make this QRS to look narrower. I would opt for a CRT or a band. But by that time, you've committed to the procedure yes. to narrow it. So you have to have made the decision beforehand. Findings. Any? So, do you use that? Are you, sometimes, in cases when? like this. Okay. Sometimes. I think that's very reasonable. In yeah. Care HF, they use echo yeah. for the for the narrow QRSs. We didn't use echo, but case one, overwhelming um, support for CRT. The patient actually worsened following CRT. His condition worsened, although it looks like good substrate. It worsened. Case two improved. She became a super responder starting off with 122, and we didn't narrow the QRS, interestingly, but nevertheless, she became a super responder. Coincidence? Placebo Survival effect? Hmm? Could be. But she had a generator change, and she got infected. We extracted her, and then she unresponded, pulmonary edema. And again, going back to the volumes here, small volumes, diastolic volumes is small, her height was, was short, 160 centimeters. LV mass was the normal range. So maybe this is all coincidence, but we re-implanted her and EF went back to 58%. So this is a class three indication in Europe. So we need to challenge it. This is important, it's a life-saving therapy. Yeah, so we need to choose our patients more carefully. ESC guidelines from 2013 supported generally until last year, and I'll come back to that, generally, QRS of more than 150, left bundle branch block 1A recommendation. And in fact, 2021 ESC guidelines diluted the recommendation for moderate range QRS, 130 to 149. Less than 130 is still class three. So it went from one to two A. Is that reasonable? Well, if we look at Japan, more than 120 is class 1A recommendation. Completely different. This is class three in Europe for 120 to 129. It's one, class 1A in Japan. How do you reconcile this? There must be a reason for this. It must be built on experience. But so this. Let's say the Japanese are not uh, like uh, Europeans. They're smaller. So why should that matter? Uh, also, don't forget uh, in, the, in Japan, they used uh, uh, the Bitagram low dose it was in Japan because of the size, yeah? So probably size matters. And I'm not a me too person, right? 
because I see my, one of my trainees, she thinks that I'm um, a Me Too guy, you know? So size does matter, I think. It's not in the guidelines. That's not an electrical measure. We're electrophysiologists. So how does that work? If I remember well, and uh, Dr. Pagurelius can correct me, when we measure something, we, uh, we want to do it according to, uh, to correct it according to the mass index, isn't it? Yeah? No? Not always. Structural measures, Structural yes. Structural measures. But not electrical. Yeah. Okay. But should we? But well, electricity comes, that. is it uh, the same time that electricity travels through a big ventricle and uh, through a small ventricle, maybe? Thank you, but let me come back to that. Thank you. Okay. Very I like point. the orca, by the way. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, CG. So let's talk about, we're talking about personalized medicine now, and we talk about uh, doing uh, genotyping. But Y chromosome and X chromosome are very different. So let's look at obvious differences, genetic differences. So sex-specific CRT, is there a difference? Well, if you look at ICDs, this is a nationwide cohort. It's not a randomized trial. We don't have any demographic data. It's just, an, it's just a cohort. There's no difference between male and female survival following ICD. And this is in about, uh, what, 85,000 patients in the United States. No survival difference between ICDs, between male and female. So no sex difference there. CRT, major sex difference. Women do better, they survive more. Hazard ratio is 0 0.76, so 24% better survival amongst women following CRT. I'll come back to that number, 24% later. So why? And uh, Vasilis was talking about size. So people have looked at height, and this is a meta-analysis of all the Medtronic trials. And if you look at hazard ratios here, plotted as a function of QRS duration, as QRS gets longer, this is the hazard ratio. So if you look for women in the red line, hazard ratio falls less than one at about 130 milliseconds, less than 130. So my, my case two ECG, the human ECG, falls in this category hazard ratio drops below one and peaks around 130, 135 amongst women. But tall men do very poorly. And recall that all the CRT trials have been conducted in populations drawn from Northern European extraction, German and English. Those trials were done in those countries or they were done in North America, coming from that stuff, and generally male, about 80% male. So all CRT trials and therefore indications have been built on those data. But tall men begin to respond at 145, 150. So the guidelines are fine. They're fine for this subpopulation of tall men. Short men actually do very well. So size matters, yes. Differences in height appear to account for why CRT conferred greater benefit for women than for men. And men in the shortest tercile appear to have a prognostic benefit from CRT, even when QRS duration was less than 130. So again, very provocative. The guidelines for 130 and less in Europe, being a class three indication for CRT, were built on ECHO CRT, which selected tall German men. All right, so let's go back to Asia. We looked at this in a registry. And Asians had a much higher response rate in the moderate QRS range, 120 to 149, compared to the Americas. 30% better response rate. So this is important. So we talked about QRS width. Higher QRS width confers more probability. Yes, as you get narrower, the probability of response goes down. On the other hand, size does matter. Taller people do poorly. As you get shorter, you're more likely to benefit. So is there a connection between these two? So we explored this. We looked at the ratio of QRS to height in Asia. So when the QRS is above 150, flat lines, it's as the QRS D over height, 
increased, no change in response rate. Remained high for Asians and Americans. Asians still a little bit higher, but straight line. But for moderately prolonged QRS, that's less than 150, there's a straight line here. So probability of response increases as the QRSD height ratio increases. And above 0.8 here, milliseconds per centimeter, which is 80 milliseconds per meter, and I'll come back to that number, you start getting more than 50% chance of response. So then the probability is for you, this number. So yes, when you integrate size, it does matter. So this perhaps accounts for the differences between Asians and Americans. So this was developed in greater detail in a publication this year. And this is from the Duke uh, Cardiac Research Institute, so a very accomplished trials unit. They have a great pedigree, a great history, and they have the power to get patient-level data from all the pivotal CRT trials. Patient-level data from, all the, from both Medtronic and from Guidant. Patient-level data from seven pivotal trials. So very, very important. More than 5,600 patients. And they assessed the relationships between QRS duration and CRT effects overall and in sex stratified cohorts. And looked at QRS duration by height. Endpoints were heart failure, hospitalization, or death, or all cause mortality. I'll go to one of their striking findings. There's a 20% difference in survival advantage in women. Going back to my first nationwide cohort, women had a 24% improvement, and that's from 70,000 patients, but without patient-level data. So from two different sources, large data sets, the survival advantage in women is confirmed. This is a therapy designed for women, and yet most of them are not treated. So they looked at QRS threshold for response, and overall the threshold was 137 milliseconds. When they split it by gender, Men again began to respond, hazard ratio dropping below one at 145 milliseconds. Women, 126, 126. So again, flouting current European guidelines. They also looked at QRS duration over height. And the threshold for response, when you normalize by height, really closes the gap between men and women. And again, we come up with this number of 80 milliseconds per meter then there is no sex difference in threshold for QRS effect. But what you see, so this is when you should consider CRT in your patient. Now, the actual magnitude of response still remains superior in women, still remains superior. So this normalization for height does not explain that. So some points that uh, I raised in this, uh, in this commentary on that paper were that indexing QRS duration for body size might improve selection of patients for CRT, particularly when you have a borderline QRS duration. Some patients with QRS duration less than 120 may benefit. Now that's very provocative, but the data are pointing that way. Recall that the normal QRS in humans is about 86 to 90 milliseconds. So 110, is large, is prolonged. And the Japanese actually have identified a cut point of 114 milliseconds. So we're really out of range of our guidelines now, well out of range. There may be a sex indifferent threshold for patient selection when QRS is indexed for body size. But adjustments for body size don't explain the magnitude of difference. There's still an inherent um, sex specific effect advantageous to women and most marked in the mid-QRS range. So we explored this. Now we looked at LV size, not body size. So this is from a group of non-ischemics, pure non-ischemics, Straussian left bundle, pure left bundles, QRS duration, probability of response. And you see again, overall, it peaks at about 145, 150. You split it by men and women. Men do poorly, perhaps reasonably well at 150, 160. Women do extremely well. So the remodeling was very different. And as Vasilis said, 
Male and female remodeling can be very different. We measured this. So overall, there's a normal distribution in dark red here. Amongst females, most of them fall with lower LV mass. So they remodel without dilatation and without hypertrophy. Men, on the other hand, dilate and have a lot of hypertrophy. And if you plot the ratio of QRS over LV mass, women have more advantage. And again, the point that our chairman made, if the LV mass is large, if my side volume is large, it takes longer for the propagating wavefront to go through, so the QRS will be prolonged. But then I would ask, is that sufficient to explain this? But I'll come back to that point. But yes, that's definitely an effect. So, in this case, when you normalize QRS over LV volume, then there's no difference between men and women. It's just that women tend to ride on this high phase of the, uh, of the curve, plateau phase at the peak, at the peak of the uh, curve. Men on the lower side. But these curves now coincide overall, men and women. These curves are the same. This is that men populate the lower reaches. So interesting. I mean, we're talking about non-electrophysiological factors now modulating an electrical therapy that's designed to correct an electrical problem. So what are the relationships between amplitude, QRS amplitude, QRS duration, height, LV mass, and sex? So we looked at this in detail. I'll just show you two plots here. So for QRS and LV mass, there is a significant relationship for both men and women, stronger for women. Between height and LV mass, there is no relationship. So why height matters is a little bit of a puzzle. But I also draw your attention to this. While this is statistically significant, the correlation is actually quite poor. 0 0.4, 0 0.49, it's not strong. There's something else going on, which is not explained purely by size, LV size. And when you look at these interrelationships and the correlations between QRS duration, LV mass, and height, you see QRS amplitude, no correlation with height. QRS duration, no correlation with height. Um, there is correlation of LV mass with QRS duration, and with height, possibly in males, I'm sorry, possibly in women. Um, slight, but not strong. So a lot of unexplained features. So there's more to it. And then I go back to my ORCA ECG. I don't know what the mass of the left ventricle is in ORCA, but it's going to be large. It's going to be large. I think we're all agreed on that. But look at the QRS duration. It's not wide. It's not wide. So this relationship between QRS duration and size is by no means uh, strong in humans or in very athletic mammals. Something else is going on. And perhaps we're getting an insight with, with modern mapping techniques. And uh, uh, from George Catricis and his group here, not a Straussian left bundle, but a wide QRS of left bundle type morphology. And you see that the Kinjay potentials are preserved. So there's no left bundle branch block. And the physiological pacing group have shown this. 30% of patients with a proper left bundle branch block still have intact Kinjay tissue. And this group found that breakouts under these conditions of the left ventricle were relatively well preserved. So patients with a broader QRS had fewer LV breakout sites from the conduction system, but there was evidence of LV breakout from an intact conduction system in most patients with left bundle branch block. So then where is the delay? So if it's not in the Pekinje system, and it's not LV mass, I would suggest it's probably in uh, the properties of intermyocyte conduction. Fibrosis interferes with that, scar interferes with that, so size is not enough. The quality of the intermyocyte connections matter. And possibly they're extremely enhanced in orcas and killer whales. And possibly with the remodeling process are better preserved in women. So the remodeling characteristics differ not only macroscopically in terms of LV size and volume, but also likely at the uh, molecular level. But in any case, what I'd like to suggest 
is that we have to recognize non-electrical modulators of target substrate. We have to recognize that it's not only QRS, but body size that matters and LV size. And I'm pleased that in the 2023 guidelines, unfortunately EHRA didn't participate in this, for the first time we have sex-specific guidelines. Sex-specific guidelines, this is a very strong statement, with a class 1A recommendation. So the moderately prolonged QRS, 120 to 149, not even 130 to 149, but 120 to 49, 149. In patients with select characteristics, for example, female sex, with EF less than 35, sinus rhythm, left frontal branch block, 120 to 149, 5E pacing is recommended to reduce mortality, very important therapy, and heart failure events to improve EF. So I'm very pleased this got into the guidelines because this has been a neglected group neglected and denied a, heart, a survival benefiting therapy. Thank you very much. Amazing stuff. Thank you very much, Neeraj. Uh, it's a historic moment because you change the guidelines or they're going to be changed. Uh, but as you said, uh, Initially, okay, size, but, and then the interconnections. Yes. And somebody may ask why this model, disease model, has different connections. So why the response is good in that compared to another one? Then that's the next step. Yes. Or the next question. Yes. But it's very interesting. And I'm very jealous because women always are the winners. Would I, would I young? Okay. We think that we are the powerful uh, uh, sex, yes, but at the end of the day, they get married again after we die. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you resynchronize them. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, any, any questions? Stati. Uh, Dr. Pagurelias is with us, and uh, he is just uh, been elected as an associate professor in our department. So congratulations! congratulations. Professor Farah, congratulations for your talk. Uh, actually, I have a major disadvantage. I, I'm not an electrophysiologist. I'm actually an imager and a cardiographist. Ah. That's an advantage, yes. <laughs> so uh, my major question is, uh, most of the times when we have to select a CRT candidate, actually we see some major echo characteristics. For example, I'm not very optimistic if my patient has a white uh, QRS, but he hasn't, for example, septal flash or uh, uh, what uh, we rocking. say, an apical rocking. So, do we pay so much attention on QRS in order to describe a very complex phenomenon like the synchrony? I mean, should we pay more attention um, on, uh, let's say, uh, easy to notice echo markers like septal flash or apical rocking, irrespective of sex, height, or LV size? Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you for that comment. And Aligned with you, I've been thinking a lot about septal flash and apical rocking. Um, all the trials from 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that assessed echo indices as a, a candidate selection measure or as a CRT optimization measure were unsuccessful. All of them were neutral. There were no positive results. I think they were trying to be too clever and using dyssynchrony indices from that era, which may not have reported the pathology that is um, treatable by CRT. And going back to septal flash and apical rocking, they seem to be consistent. They seem to be consistent. Um, I have some questions about th those, those measures. What um, period, systolic interval or diastolic interval, do they occur in? When does the, because we, they're, they're not measurable. These are visually assessed. Um, observations. So it's hard to put that into a scientific trial. So I was wondering whether you could actually 
um, assign them some way of re reproducible measurements and degree of septal flash, degree of rocking. Because as far as I understand, these are observations. Actually, with the introduction of uh, deformation imaging, so longitudinal strain, uh, we can quantify and see also with high temporal resolution uh, this phenomena. For example, a septal flash, we can see it on the bullseye that we uh, produce from the longitudinal strain, that we may have septal flash and also apical rocking. So uh, I think we live in the era that we may quantify this phenomena. And uh, as far as I know, there's a, a very large multicenter study that's running right now in order to see if we could quantify this phenomena and if these are, um, let's say, appropriate for selecting good candidates for CRT. So I think that's an excellent idea because of all the echo measures, I think uh, these two have been consistent and maybe they have been obscured by all the other dyssynchrony indices that we used to use from a previous era. So it's time to reevaluate that. Thank you very much. Petro? Uh, okay. I think uh, we have no other words uh, except thank you, Neeraj. It was a privilege to have you with us. And we hope we'll pay it back tomorrow uh, in the nice setting of uh, Tsangarada. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure.